NRMN network by texting NRMN to 22828 to join. So today uh, we are discussing CAM, digging deeper, doing better, research, science, and the messiness of engaging cultural diversity. So culturally aware mentoring CAM, scientists are cultural beings that are often reticent to acknowledge cultural diversity matters amongst themselves. Engaging with such matters is sometimes used as irrelevant to or detecting from doing science, and it's just plain messy. This webinar will review evidence documenting how race and privilege shape individuals and institutions, including career trajectory and the research training enterprise. Review key terms useful in understanding experiences of scientists from efforts within NRMN to support scientists, hence digging deeper and doing better with engaging cultural diversity matters. So without further ado, may I present Dr. Angela Byers Winston and Dr. Rick McGee. And Dr. Angela Byers Winston is an associate professor in the University of Wisconsin Madison, Department of Medicine, and Director of Research and Evaluation in the UW Madison Center for Women's Health Research. Her research investigates cultural influences on academic and career development, especially for racial and ethnic minorities and women in the science, sciences, engineering, and medicine fields. Dr. Byers Winston is co investigator for the Mentoring Training Corps for NRMN. And Dr. Rick McGee, Associate Dean and Facu for Faculty Recruitment and Professional Development Professor for Medical Education at Northwestern University. He is responsible for guiding the development of research expertise of young clinical and basic science faculty and is currently the PI of several NIH-funded research initiatives, including co-investor for the Mentoring and Training, as well as the Professional Development Course within the National Research Mentoring Network, or commonly known as NRMN. Thank you very much for taking the time, doctors. Um, without further ado, let us dive in. Great. Thank you so much to Damaris. And we also want to thank the leadership from the National Research Mentoring Network who have been extremely gracious in sharing their uh, precious resources with us and the opportunity for myself and Rick and wonderful collaboration of colleagues around the country to do this work. Uh, I want to start off by uh, referring to the choice that we made to use the specific word of messiness around engaging cultural diversity. We know that many of us on the uh, call have been doing work for a number of years around broadening scientific workforce diversity. And the, the reality is that if it were easy work, it would have been achieved and addressed long ago. It is difficult, it is hard work, and it is, my, as my colleague Star Shark will say, it is heart work. And it involves messiness since so there aren't easy answers. And so Rick and I want to start off by acknowledging that part of our interest in this webinar today is to really create a space for a conversation to happen, to share with you a little bit about what we've been doing and hear and learn from you all uh, who have shared your afternoon with us this afternoon. So again, we want to acknowledge the support and opportunity that the National Research Mentoring Network platform has given us. Our time together today will be uh, divided basically into two halves. One is to, uh, first of all, as, as after Damaris has already introduced us, is to share a little bit more about um, what the work of CAM has been about, the Culturally Aware Mentorship Initiative. And our goals are twofold, specifically to increase your understanding about how cultural diversity matters are related to research trainees' development, especially their academic and career outcomes, and implications for career success, and then share a little bit more about the culturally aware mentorship resources as well as the NRMN resources that are available to, uh, to the country to support uh, the development of future scientists in deep, digging deeper and doing better as we engage with cultural diversity. So we really have two halves of this uh, time together. The first half is to present the rationale for and the description of our culturally aware mentorship initiatives and then leave the last 15 to 20 minutes or so for a rich discussion and question and answer uh, time with you all. We're excited to learn from you as much as share with you. I want to also acknowledge that we have um, also braved into a new world. I can think it's safe to say that for myself and Rick in particular, into the Twitter world and social media. And so I want to... <laughs> 
<laughs> I want to thank Alexis uh, Short for this time in monitoring um, a Twitter feed with the hashtag woke mentoring that is active now. Um, and so we're excited that and inviting you to please share your thoughts and your comments and your reactions as we go throughout the day and certainly beyond this day uh, on that Twitter feed. For those who are not yet tweeters, we also have two functions within this um, GoToMeeting platform. You'll see on the right side uh, there's a section for chatting and there's a section for asking questions or posing questions. And again, our colleagues from NRMM are graciously monitoring that. So we really want to invite you to have a discussion with us uh, today. So we'll dive right in and uh, want to highlight it, uh, kind of the larger issue for those of us who might be newer to the efforts of the National Research Mentoring Network. Uh, we want to explain a little bit about why NRMN decided to put the development of such tools um, from the Culturally Aware Mentoring Group into such a high priority. And so as we talk about this, we want to uh, Rick and I wanted to give you a little context in terms of how we came to the Culturally Aware Mentorship Initiative. And we start off by acknowledging the fact that um, there is a large culture of silence about culture and science. Um, many of our colleagues and many of us have been challenged, especially in our disciplinary uh, traditions, to not see culture to not want to hear about it and to not talk about culture. And so we see ourselves as quote unquote scientists who are pursuing the objective um, nature of truth uh, through rigorous observation methods and um, issues that are more subjective in nature in terms of culture, lived experiences, identities are seen as less relevant uh, to the doing and the performing performance of science. And so when we talk about um, the messiness of science, we are literally aware that we are pushing up against cultural traditions, both within the disciplinary trainings that we have, but also our identities that may make us more reticent to addressing cultural diversity issues. Uh, the work that many of our colleagues have been doing, myself and Rick included, within the culturally aware mentorship group have really found about four or five trends of attitudes or beliefs that have made it very difficult to engage in uh, cultural diversity matters within science and more specifically within the research mentoring uh, community. Um, one is that there are beliefs that cultural diversity is irrelevant to science, that uh, if I talk about science or diversity issues, I might be misperceived as prejudiced. Um, I brought up an issue that perhaps might not be seen as relevant, so now I'm the one who's the bad person. Um, many of us are actually just aren't aware that there are salient matters of cultural diversity that impose and intersect uh, the research training experience. Um, and then for those of us who might be interested in talking about cultural diversity, it's very difficult to know how to do that. How do we start addressing these issues within the relationship? And so we know that cultural diversity matters are challenging in the sciences in particular. Um, the irony is that even though we have this um, interest in addressing and increasing a scientific, a more diverse scientific workforce, we talk about issues that might impede achieving that diversity in the workforce, but don't really want to get into the issues that contribute to those uh, disparities. Um, and yet all of our research continually shows and demonstrates evidence that uh, issues relating to cultural diversity are related to and somehow contributing to the uneven research and mentoring landscape within the sciences. Uh, on your screen are a couple of studies that many of you are already aware of. You, uh, some of you might even have contributed to these studies that show the racial ethnic disparities, the gender disparities in terms of R01 awards, uh, the way that applicants are rated and reviewed, um, the way that students' requests for career advice are um, received, and the way that we hire and train different groups of individuals. Much of the work that we're certainly citing today is focusing on race, ethnicity, and gender, but Rick and I want to acknowledge that it's the diversity, the, the continuum of the human diversity experience that includes other factors besides race, ethnicity, and gender, like ability status, like sexual orientation, generational status, sometimes socioeconomic status in terms of who has access 
to higher education, who has access to being uh, mentored and seen as a, a future scientist, whose science is valued. So I want to acknowledge that although we might highlight for exemplary purposes and illustrative purposes, uh, dynamics related to race, ethnicity, and gender that we're certainly interested in and acknowledge the, the role of all human diversity in affecting uh, the future of the scientific workforce. So here's the challenge that uh, two colleagues highlighted very nicely in an August issue of uh, the New York Times, an op-ed piece in the New York Times uh, in August of 2016. And they acknowledge this interesting challenge. Again, we want to have this diverse biomedical workforce, but the conversations about why we lack that diversity is often left to racial and ethnic minority researchers themselves, for example. Um, and for other people, these conversations are still viewed as uncomfortable, distracting, irrelevant, or a waste of time. And so we know, as um, Rick and I have engaged with this work in our, with our colleagues in the Culturally Aware Mentorship Group, is that there are very few spaces within academic centers where we can have these frank and transparent conversations, as our colleagues noted in this op-ed, about race and the legacy of racism and other dynamics that contribute to these disparities. And so part of the culturally aware mentoring group is situated within this very challenge of how do we create these spaces and open up opportunities for more dialogue, specifically for research mentors who hold such powerful roles in generating the next a group of scientists. And so when we think about diversifying the scientific workforce and addressing the messiness of engaging with cultural diversity within sciences, uh, for us it seemed like working with the mentors who are involved in training the next generation of scientists uh, made sense. And so uh, just to bring this point to a close, and then I'll be turning it over to uh, Rick, is that we also uh, are pursuing this work both the National Research Mentoring Network and the Culturally Aware Mentorship Initiative within that, based on some priorities from our federal leaders like Hannah Valentine and uh, Dr. Francis Collins uh, at the National Institutes of Health, who in 2015 in an article highlighted the need for using scientific approaches to address diversity matters within the biomedical uh, scientific workforce. And our particular work really lies within the locus of these evidence-based approaches to advancing the training in, that occurs within the biomedical workforce. And so we just want to acknowledge for those, again, who might be new to the National Research Mentoring Network, welcome. We certainly hope this is not the last time that you'll be a part of this community. I uh, wanted to let you know who this community is. The overall mission of the National Research Mentoring Network, which is funded by the NIH is to provide high quality training and evidence uh, to all trainees across the health, oops, I went too fast, across, <laughs> the, health, <laughs> across the health sciences with evidence-based mentorship and develop professional development that helps uh, maximize access to resources, emphasizes the benefits and challenges of diversity and inclusivity, and helps to increase the ways that uh, culture can be more effectively addressed within mentoring relationships and again more broadly into the scientific workforce with a larger goal of enhancing the diversity of uh, the biomedical workforce. So we want to acknowledge our fearless leader, our uh, principal investigator of one of the principal investigators of NRMN, who is Dr. Christine Fund from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, who is also the director of the Mentor Training Corps in which the culturally aware mentorship lies. So I'd like to turn it over to you, Rick, and uh, help okay. us to understand a little bit more about what we're doing. Thanks very much, Angela. And I think I can't actually operate, so I'm going to quick do a you know, chain presenter. So I'm going to steal the, steal the show. And uh, hopefully, eh, let's see where to go. There we are. I think we can share my screen, and we go into present mode. And how did that, that work? Perfect. All right. Technology wins again. All right, well, thanks very much, uh, Angela, and everyone for tuning in. Um, so what we want to do now is kind of really move a little bit more into the, the kind of the nuts and bolts and the, the history of where the culture aware mentoring training came uh, came from and kind of walk you through. We felt it was kind of um, valuable to kind of share a little bit of the process of how we went through because it's really, uh, we were 
you know, we work for this quite a long time, and I'm probably everyone on the phone and listening in has been highly engaged, or vast majority of you, in ever, you know, entering or creating better mentoring experiences. But what what really made this possible was the oh, looks like I get I'm oh, probably not cut off anyway on my screen. It looks like or two of us are cut off, but probably in your screen it's not. Um, but this is the this is our team. Uh, and this is what really made it possible. We had a wonderful uh, experience with eight of us, you know, from multiple institutions, from multiple experiences, from uh, from coast to coast, uh, almost anyway, from Cal State Northridge all the way to University of Maryland and, you know, and Wisconsin and Northwestern. I think what you really saw is that the team benefited by this uh, tremendous uh, kind of range of experiences, ages, gender, kind of any any variable you can think of, we had a you know a piece of it, uh, especially within the you know the scientific and uh, development scheme. So this is what we you know had, and all of us were at different levels of participation within the um, mentor training core, in particular of the of the NRMN. And and when we started out, um, we were really thinking about kind of what are the where are we starting from? What's the core question? Yeah, and, and one of the core questions is how prepared are we as individuals and in, in, the, in our work and our personal lives of prepared to really talk about culture diversity and sensitivity, you know, and particularly as when you're in this mentor trainee role where you have, it's a, it's a very important space from the standpoint of development of, of skills and moving within a career and how, you know, how comfortable are we and prepared to do that. And so even thinking for everyone who's part of this, think for a couple seconds, you know, how, how comfortable and how prepared are you to talk about this? And, and as we thought about it, even all of us were at different stages of that, had different experiences. So that kind of was the starting point we're coming from. Um, and but then really kind of the questions we were asking as we got started in, in this activity is, is what's it like to talk about race and racism and other factors and you know what is it how does it make people feel and what what are the barriers that, that we have and this is a whole lot bigger than science I mean this is this is a, a whole social question in our entire country and and science is by no means immune to it so it's it's the bigger the broader whole social question but then how does this play out and how does it affect particular mentoring relationships so then the, the really the, the CAM training came about as an initiative to really increase uh, the awareness of culture and the role that it plays within mentoring relationships and how to you know really improve that and, and make it less of a barrier for uh, for discussion so we spent a long time so uh, you know literally we spent 18 months working together you know we uh, before we actually you know went out on the road for the very first time and it was it was interesting because we we drew on each of us had a whole different collective experience Many of us had kind of experiences with diversity training, which weren't always the most satisfying, I could say, and all had different experiences of mentoring and you know, being mentored and theories of behavior, all these different things. So they're really kind of a, a really fascinating and incredibly rich mix of, of, a pro, uh, of experiences. So we really, and then from there, we also sought out and really looked further into prior work and prior research that's been done around this. And so over that 18 months, we kind of gradually built, and I want to emphasize rebuilt, the initial curriculum. Every time we thought we kind of had it figured out, we thought, oh, wait a minute. So it was literally a curriculum. I, I wouldn't even begin to guess what version we were on by the time we finally felt ready to kind of take it out and see how it worked. Um, so why why did we take this overall approach? It, it really we're coming from a series of, of core assumptions, you know, that we really are all cultural beings. It's just that that's the part of the human experience, and these factors really do shape and are involved in mentoring and training relationships. And by ignoring those, you know, you you maintain the privilege and the status quo, which we're obviously we're trying to change the status quo. Or wouldn't be in this, um, and that racism, privilege, and unconscious bias are very real. And these are not things that happen everywhere else, but in science are absolutely very real. And the ability of mentors to kind of engage with this and understand this is, is typically quite limited. And, you know, and I would be the first one to say, even as I got started in this a long time, even through this process, and I've been working in diversity initiatives for literally my whole career. And going through this process had a, a profound impact on me as well. So no matter how much you've kind of been engaged, you think you understand it, there's so much more to, to learn. Um, and it, it, again, I think that it really takes an intentional engagement. These, again, are other core assumptions to really make a difference. And by enhancing the mentor's cultural awareness is a fundamental step. So you have to start with yourself. 
until you can under, you know, work with yourself, it's really hard to take this into you know, a mentoring relationship. But then really inform this from a lot of theory. There's a tremendous amount of work and, and, and theoretical and research out there. And so these are the core assumptions that we're really working from. We also, this is obviously we don't have time to go into depth in kind of the theoretical or the kind of the, the scholarly foundations and the research foundations, but you know this high, just kind of highlights some of the of the experience and the theories that we have brought in and things and from the practical side is how as cultural beings you know it really impacts power and privilege and but it's within a self and context how each of us are and how we experience these. And you know you layer on top of that institutional culture, and within institutional culture, you know the whole concept of resilience and resistance, and how these play out. Um, the consciousness raising from the standpoint of motivation, what makes people motivated to change? How might we tap into motivations, or what kind of other things we will be working within in our efforts? And then systems actually change, you know, and and that's kind of the next step. I mean, you you start with these initial phases, but our whole goal is obviously kind of to trigger institutional change towards access and opportunity. So this is just a really a, just a little snapshot of the kind of theoretical underpinnings that we're working with as well as we kind of, you know, in our own, our own messiness. And it was really quite an interesting, complex process. So then we had to really kind of come up with the objectives. You know, what is it we're trying to achieve? You know, and, and we really came up with a, a series of, you know, and this actually, like anything else, took several iterations back and forth and kind of what do we mean by these things. But it came down to some things that, you know, mentors, by the time they're done with our, our, our training our, or workshops and approaches, really start by under, understanding their own identity, uh, cultural beliefs and, and identities. Again, the, the fundamental principle is you, you can't work with understanding somebody else until you have a bit more of an understanding of yourself. You know, and really then, you know, to be able to understand how cultural diversity can impact and both complicate and benefit mentoring relationships. You know, the people would need to be able to acknowledge this impact of conscious and unconscious bias and how this affects relationships. Then really come up with moving from understanding into actually principles to guiding how they work with people. And we actually, interestingly, we went back and forth many times. Are we talking about culturally aware mentorship? Are we tra talking about culturally competent mentorship? And we ultimately ended up with awareness because, you know, awareness is continually growing. Competence tends to kind of say, well, okay, I'm competent, so I'm done. Yeah, and, and we just don't see that that's probably a space that any of us are going to get to in any short period of time for sure. And then really these evidence-based strategies to really reduce and counteract some of these impacts of, uh, of everything that's going on. So now just to give you a quick uh, synopsis of the actual components, um, it's we came up with a one long intensive day, about seven hours. Um, but believe me, no one is sitting and listening to us talk at them for seven hours. That would put me asleep and it would definitely put them to sleep. So it's a very active uh, day. Um, but one of the things that's a really critical emphasis is on guiding conversations and dialogue. So it's a very dialogue, very conversation-based uh, you know, approach. Um, time doesn't, doesn't pull out of punches, but it also really gives people a space to be honest and talk about things they've never had the opportunity to talk about. As we, as we got through it, one of the things we discovered that the dialogue that we really were you know, initiating or among peers and colleagues and realizing have those conversations with people you know, you had to get that point before you could even begin to think about how you bring this in with people who you're mentoring uh, as well. Um, the design, we deliberately have co-facilitators, so we have different perspectives even in the, in, throughout the, uh, the training. Um, we actually, as we went through, we actually created a facilitator guide because we knew there was no way we were going to be able to, eight of us, kind of, uh, you know, do this forever. So we actually are in, you know, have a guide as we created it for other people to learn how to do it. Um, we found that we needed to create a pre-session module. This is an online module we created, so it frees up more time for dialogue and conversation. And then we actually developed a really a uh, culture awareness skills gain survey because how do we know if we're doing anything? You know, it's, it's the last thing we want to do is come up and say, okay, we've, we've uh, kind of come up with something, we're done. You know, so we've really been looking at this with just a little snippet of some data that has come from that as we, as we go on. So this is kind of the core kind of design. So what's in it? So here's kind of an example of, of where we've got. So we've got kind of four different foci. One is just first this cultural awareness. And then after awareness, you kind of go to strategies and behaviors. 
And then the question is, once you get some of these things, what kind of confidence do you have? And then by the end of the day, okay, you've done this, now what commitment and how do you come up with kind of doing something more after the training? So this is not designed to be, okay, I've been trained, I can check this off my box. It's, unless people are able to do something with it, it really, I'm not, you know, it's really not worth the time they put into it. So real goal, what do you do with this new information? And so on the right-hand side, it shows some examples of how the, each of the activities we've aligned with, you know, a type of focus. And some of these are the, the pre-course modules and the something we use called the culture box, which has turned out to be a really, really effective kind of icebreaker in getting people thinking about culture within the, the space of relationships. We have case studies, we have role plays, we have small group discussions, we have self-reflection. So you can see it's a, it's a pretty eclectic mixture of tools, and by the time you're done, you're kind of hoping to kind of walk out with a toolkit or, or a plan. So that's kind of the design of the actual activities. So then briefly, okay, what have we learned? Um, well, during 2016, we actually um, you know, conducted five different uh, trainings and uh, no two are alike. And that was one of the reasons we, we want to give ourselves a chance to try something, see if it works, what didn't work, what did work, tweak it a little bit, try something different. And so we've done this about five times. You can see by the numbers down there, we had a, you know, at least a, about a, over 110 um, faculty and uh, you know, senior individuals. The master facilitators, this is a group of individuals within the um, NRMN who are really prepared to kind of lead a lot of the facilitation of, of general mentor training uh, activities. Um, and so we actually got to practice on, on them as well. So this is just one little snapshot of some of the uh, perceived skill gains. So within this, we actually broke it down to a series of actual skills that ideally people develop to then be kind of engage in culturally aware mentoring practices. So these, you know, you can see the on the bottom some of the things like uh, intentionally creating opportunities for talking about race, ethnicity. So this is one of the key elements of are you comfortable saying, I'm going to go out of my way to actually make it possible to have conversations? So that, for example, you see the people when they started, they you know, didn't know how to do that, and that's not easy to do. And so, again, perceived big, big, pretty big changes on these. So we really were quite pleased that even the, the data we're getting, and, and we've also been doing uh, qualitative interviews and qualitative data, so we've got a very rich uh, understanding of how it's beginning to have some impacts. Um, our goal now, one of the things is we're beginning to start doing follow-ups with people a year later. Okay, it's nice to say, okay, what happens after, right afterwards, but now what happens later? So that's just, again, a, a quick snapshot of uh, kind of what's involved in the, uh, in the training program. And I think next slide is, yep, turning it back over to Angela. So I think uh, you can grab the screen and take it from there. This is great. I'm so, talk about our self-efficacy going up. This is hey, great. there we go. We got it. <laughs> Okay, let's see, one more, there, I believe it's there now, okay, yep. great, Perfect. <clears throat> so where are we now, this is um, our kind of current focus and emphasis for the remainder of this calendar year is uh, to continue um, some additional trainings that are happening nationwide, um, as well as uh, getting the story out in publication form about the curricular innovation of the culturally aware mentorship um, intervention. Uh, telling a little bit more, as Rick just mentioned, about the longitudinal impact. So what are the persi persistent uh, effects of these kinds of interventions uh, beyond the pre-post immediate change on attitudes and behaviors and beliefs? So for example, are the mentors who are participating in these interventions doing something differently with their mentees? Are they doing something, having different conversations with their colleagues, for example? Are they looking at admissions criteria differently? Are they looking at their evaluation uh, criteria differently for their admissions? So what kinds of institutional change indicators can we actually look at to tell the story of the impact of these types of interventions? And this, this kind of work is certainly being um, complemented we're complementing the work of the uh, CEC within the National Research Mentoring Network, which is specifically coordinating the evaluation across this entire diversity uh, program um, consortium. And then we're also really excited to start focusing very soon on what does the culturally aware mentor train or mentorship training look like for the students themselves, for the trainees and the mentees themselves. So 
one of the things we're always aware of as, as effective um, trainees or trainers is that we know that the colleagues we're working with, early career scientists, undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, are not passive uh, individuals. They are, are agent, they are agentic um, with wonderful skill sets, cultural capital, social capital um, that can be maximized to build their capacity so that they can use these mentoring relationships to the best of their uh, benefit. And so beginning to think about how the uh, trainee curriculum might look uh, to advance culturally where mentoring principles is one of our exciting uh, new uh, interests for this year. So where we have also continued is looking at some of the uh, short-term and, and long-term uh, focus areas, as, as specifically as we mentioned, continued development of training, uh, and then long-term is beginning to push on the national, the NRMN uh, Master Facilitators Program to uh, expand the cadre of facilitators who are ready to do this work to meet the requests that are increasing for culturally aware mentorship and partner with other sites within the diversity uh, program consortium, uh, which are the BUILD institutes in particular who are charged with advancing uh, the diversity around undergraduate researchers and uh, supporting their facilitation across career stages. So we have now told you a little bit about our debutante uh, party. This is our official kind of coming out <laughs> world of what has happening for the last 18 months about culturally aware mentorship and uh, tell you a little bit about what our process has been like, where we've been, and where we'd like to go. Now, here's the scary part. I'll be real honest with you, and I think I can speak for you as well, Rick. Um, we realized that part of the work that we're doing, obviously, as um, in these culturally aware mentorship initiatives is to push the envelope to not do business as usual. Uh, in terms of addressing scientific workforce diversity. So, as I said earlier, if there were fixes that would have been effective and have moved the needle, so to speak, uh, as many of us have used that term, to diversify the sciences, to increase persistence of people who are not well represented in the sciences, it would have been done. It's difficult, which is why we use the word messy in the title of this webinar. And it also begs the question of, what are the issues we're not talking about that make it difficult to really address the, the uh, diversity issues in the scientific workforce? Our team regularly says, and I've said it before, is that diversifying the science, scientific workforce is not just about increasing the numbers of diverse people in the workforce, but addressing the diversity issues that are in the workforce already that cause and compromise the persistence and performance and attraction of various groups into these fields. And so we have had some conversations that have been quite, quite rich over the last 18 months of working together around what are the larger challenges around the silence of these difficult conversations about inclusivity, equity, and diversity as we think about changing the face of science. And so as we prepared for 2016, 2017 and kind of the, the way that we want to, as a CAM group, be a part of the National Research Mentoring Network's effort to diversify science, increase quality mentoring, we had to really think about, well, what type of mentoring are we talking about? Because many of our colleagues, when they come through uh, the trainings, again, as Rick mentioned, it's a one-day commitment. So for many people, it's quite a long time to invest in these kinds of conversations and the first time that many of our colleagues have. What are we actually asking them to do that's different than what they've already done? We have many of our colleagues who are saying, I'm just fine. I've been effective. I've been training folks for a long period of time. I have a track record of getting trainees out of the door. I can show you their placements of where they've gone postdoc, post-baccalaureate uh, in terms of placements. They're successful. So isn't quality mentoring and, and just, just about being a good mentor and listening and, and having good manners, and that's one of the things we're pushing on is that there is more to being an effective mentor than um, being nice <laughs> and being um, you know, supportive in the ways that we think about just showing up on a regular basis for our trainees. And so one of our colleagues in the, uh, research, excuse me, on the culturally aware mentoring team, uh, Emily Witzerath, and I hope she doesn't mind me uh, giving her a shout out. Hi, Emily. 
uh, suggested that we also get into the social media space and continue these conversations because what we're finding is that even after seven hours together, and I, Rick, I think you could attest to this, people don't leave. You would think they might be clamoring for the door <laughs> to run out. Conversations are just starting. And wouldn't it be a wonderful platform to really think about a Twitter feed or someplace in social media space to talk about what is the issue around culturally we're mentoring in particular with the mentors since we're working with them right now um, that we could push on to advance the conversation towards inclusivity and equity. And so Emily suggested the hashtag woke mentoring. And I have to tell you, there definitely is a generational piece here in terms of <laughs> The valence of that word um, for many of us has is very provocative. We might be familiar with it. For others, it had no valence at all. So we wanted to take a second now as we move towards open this up to conversation. As you can see, Rick and I wanted to kind of move quickly through this space of telling a little bit of, more about CAM, why we took the approach we've done. Uh, we have a suite of, of resources that we can show you and that are available on uh, the NRMN net.net portal, um, but we want to have time to talk about not doing business as usual when we talk about culturally aware mentoring. And this term, woke, seemed to be a provocative one for us to kind of chew on. And I have to say, it was nervous making. Uh, this is not a typical word you would see in an NIH community. I think that's safe to say. <laughs> um, so we wanted to take a second and um, give you kind of the working definitions of why this spoke to us, and then we want to bring this to a formal close in terms of the PowerPoint-driven part of this presentation, and then we'd like to get over to um, some questions that we have for you. And again, if you haven't uh, started to think of some or ones that you want to pose, we invite you to use the chat uh, window as well as post questions uh, through um, the GoToMeeting um, dialogue that's up for you. So what does woke mean? If we had a chance to take a poll, I would imagine that for many of us, there would be not much information about uh, what woke means. The way that we're using it is specifically how it's historically been used in the last 15 or so years to refer to awareness about systemic injustices and particularly the persistence of racism in the United States. What's very interesting is that you can think about the analogy of woke to being parallel to, be crit to being critically conscious aware of how systems and dynamics outside of individuals contribute to disparities in education, in training, in health, et cetera. And so when we think about what it means to be woke, if you take the literal meaning from being asleep means that you're not aware of these issues, being woke suggests that there's a consciousness, there is an awareness, there is a reality appreciation that there are dynamics that are differentially uh, functioning for individuals across the United States so that we don't all have the same starting line, so to speak. We're not all uh, having the same access and opportunity to quality mentoring, for example, which is one of the reasons that NRMN was initiated. Now, the term woke does not want to stop there and suggest that there's an endpoint just like cultural competence and being culturally aware, as Rick said, is not an endpoint, it's a process. And so the phrase stay woke is part of that phraseology that invokes the ongoing nature of being self-aware and critically conscious or critically aware of how practices and policies can contribute to inequities. Now, you know, here's the space where going into the social media world, there are a lot of uh, terms and definitions associated with the, with the words woke and the phrase of stay woke. If you've seen the current issue, the May issue, of Essence Magazine, which is a magazine uh, targeted specifically to African American women. The current uh, feature literally is on staying woke, the entire um, issue. So we know that there are a lot of ways that this term has been used sociopolitically, and we want to acknowledge that within our thinking as a culturally aware mentorship uh, team, we're really focusing on how these terms connect to ongoing self-awareness and critical awareness. And so as we think about how this is connected to the work that you just, just described, Rick, I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about, um, before we go to, to some questions and responses, how this is connected really to the foci 
of the intervention itself, the seven days, the seven hours, excuse me, in particular. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's not a seven day treatment. No, we haven't got to, that's that's the next version. We're working on that one. But <laughs> what we're really doing in terms of enabling a dialogue. So if you wanted to make a few comments about that. Yeah, I would love to. I think and I was saying that the it's what's what's really impossible to capture in a presentation like this actually is is what's going on. And I, I think the biggest thing that I've seen having led you know, co led several of them is is this actually you can really get into dialogue. And you can get into conversations, and it, in a sense, that's kind of the waking up from being just kind of well, it may be there. I don't know how to talk about it, you know. And I think what we found is that the high number of people who are really quite eager and interested in having a language, having a chance to, you know, talk about things that they don't know how to start the conversations. So kind of the role we play, we're going to start them, you know, and and you can go from there. And I think that. As I mentioned before, what was really been interesting to see is how this engages relationships between peers and between colleagues. You know, as and that I think we actually hadn't planned. I know I, I had not estimated how much that would happen as the starting point. Yeah, you know, and again, it's now you are awake. It's like you all of a sudden you 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 know you know it's kind of there, but you don't know what to call it. You don't know the names. You don't know how. But you know, again, by the time you go through this, you are awake. You know, and it's, like it's up to you then to decide where you want to take that that wakefulness. So it's you know by whatever use of the word, either the direct, the literal, or the other. I think it really does fit a lot what happened during these, uh, you know, particularly the pre-work and then the you know the seven hours of kind of intensive time together. And if I can highlight a few things, and then we want to open it up to the the larger group, is that in terms of this awakening, saying with the literal kind of um, imagery here around. Uh, staying woke or being woke is that what we're seeing a couple of times in these workshops, and Rick and I, we co-facilitated several of them together, is that there are certain places and spaces in the, inter in the intervention itself and the training where we can imagine awakening happens. For example, for many of our colleagues in the physical and life sciences, sciences, this is the first time they've thought about themselves as cultural beings. This is the first time they're thinking about the ways that their cultural values, communication styles that are culturally socialized are affecting the ways that they interact with, train, and mentor their students. We were just doing a training a couple of weeks ago with very high-profile scientists uh, around this topic, and one person had an awakening that went something like this. We were talking about, as we mentioned, the culture box activity, which allows people to really think about artifacts and um, objects that are salient to them and representative of important cultural identities and talk about how that might be useful in terms of understanding the lived experiences of their students and using the knowledge of the lived experiences of their students to support and facilitate their research mentoring with that person. And so one of the individuals had an awakening moment literally in the workshop by saying, hey, this is great, patting himself on the back for saying, I allow and invite my uh, trainees, in fact, ex expect them to any new trainee at the beginning of every semester. We all introduce ourselves and we share a little bit about our cultural background. And his woke moment was that he realized he had never done that himself. He had never shared him as a cultural being himself with his team. But what got privileged was that he assumed others had culture outside of himself, right? He happened to be a white identified individual. And there was an aha moment, literally, of oh my goodness, I have culture too, I could be sharing that I have not done that because I assume that's something that my students who are often um, from historically underrepresented backgrounds were more interested in and more prepared to do. So when we talk about these awakenings, when we talk about woke mentoring, we're really interested in kind of these critically uh, critical awareness that comes with understanding how culture affects ju not just the relationship but even the ways that I mentor my approaches to mentoring. And so as we, um, what we're finding in this intervention and what we're finding with our experiences as a team is that people want to have the conversation. They're hungry for it. And so as we go back to the original part of this um, webinar where we started with uh, referencing the article and the New York Times op-ed piece, that there are a few spaces in academic centers to have these conversations. The irony is that when our colleagues are presented with the opportunity, they go there. They want to have the conversation and then see it as valuable and useful to their training. And I want to give an example as we um, begin to open this up now um, 
of what woke mentorship looks like. An example, I did get uh, permission from both my colleagues. This picture on the left represents uh, Latanya Webb, who's a doctoral student here at the UW in biomedical engineering, and her mentor on the right, uh, Dr. Kristen Mas Masters, who's a uh, professor of BME and biomedical engineering. And um, I got their permission. We have to be Facebook friends. And a couple of weeks ago, Latanya posted on her Facebook this picture of her and her mentor. And the caption reads, when you walk into the lab and your PI is actually wearing the Black Lives Matter shirt you bought her. Stop asking me why I picked Wisconsin, which is often the issue for <laughs> the students of color, one time for the culture. And I immediately uh, made a comment on their Facebook post like, this is woke mentoring, and to which Kristen said, you know, that she's still a work in progress. It says, but clearly you're actually on the right path according to your trainee, because it wasn't about the shirt per se, but it's the fact that she had um, an affirmation from her mentor about a lived experience that's salient for her. Does the Black Lives Matter particularly specifically affect her uh, pipetting and all of the cell, you know, the cell manipulations they're doing? <laughs> I'm not sure, but that's up to LaTanya. But what LaTanya was sharing is that this is a lived experience that's important for her and for her mentor, whether it was in the shirt or to simply verbalize that this is important to you, so I understand it, and it registers and I acknowledge it with a critical piece. So simple things like being woke in the sense of, you know, whether or not you wear a shirt or not, the affirmation that comes for our trainees to know that their lived experiences are valued uh, as we mentor them. The additional um, uh, image here is from Sockness, uh, one of the posters that they had for the March for Science that happened last Saturday uh, all over the country. It happened to be the one in Washington, D.C., and this one spoke to me when we start to think about why woke mentorship is needed and why it matters, because there are diverse voices, obviously, they're going to create and contribute to the innovative solutions that we're all interested in. But we're marching because diversity does matter in science. And so as we think about all dimensions of human diversity, again, ability status, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, uh, language facility in, in, in English, for example, all of these things that provide us um, different access, different senses of value, if you will, in science are really starting to come up. We saw this very fervently. If you look on the right side here, oh, here we go again, went too fast, of the slide several hashtags that have been um, uh, percolating the, over the last couple of months in particular, one of them margin sign, another one uh, diversity in STEM, it got cut off, that have been addressing how we increase uh, the training experiences, the mentoring effectiveness for, uh, in the sciences for all individuals. So this is not just an intellectual exercise and yet another term or yet another Twitter feed that we want to put out just to, to uh, take up social media space, but really thinking about how does culturally aware mentoring um, help to uh, fit into these larger discourses about um, the diversity matters in STEM towards diversifying the scientific workforce? So we'd like to stop now. It's just about 5, I believe, um, and turn this conversation over to you and actually have a conversation. So Alexis and Demaris, I'm not sure if we've had anything that you'd like to report back that's happening on the Twitter feed, uh, chat box, or questions. And then, of course, um, Rick and I are prepared with another slide that has some preset questions if um, there aren't from our colleagues on the phone. Yeah, so we do have a couple of questions located in our chat box. So this is from Robert Avila. Institutions run on money. To conduct institutional changes, is there a source of funding to promote minorities in science in particular? Are there funded programs to promote admissions into PhD programs? Hey, the answer to that is yes. I mean, there's lots of, of that. I mean, there, you know, one can always say, should there be more? But there, I mean, that's a whole focus of a lot of the efforts of NIH and NSF from the, you know, from uh, many of their initiatives. And I think what we're trying to work on is how you complement those. You know, because it's, again, it's the relationships that people have once you start the training, you know, and, uh, you know, it's the, it's the time as you're progressing from one stage of scientific development to another that, um, you know, I think there, you know, there actually are. And I think that's, it's kind of a, it's a huge topic that, uh, you know, but, yeah, there are a lot of, of those. Again, you know, that's one of the core missions, particularly from NIGMS and all the institutes at NIH, as well as NSF has a number of programs. But the, 
Yeah, but again, I think our one of our premises is those have been operating for many, many years, and so our our kind of our mission with this activity is say, you now how do you take those individuals and help them have the best possible experience so you can maximize development of their talents? Yeah, and that's part of our argument is that that those efforts have been lagging behind in terms of how you actually in, increase the quality of the relationships and the access to relationships because relationships is what you know, it builds development. If you have a mentor-based system like research, it's the, the relationships are absolutely key and that's what we're trying to maximize as best we can. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, another question from Jody Westman. Do you have a sense of the motivations that brought mentors to the CAM workshops? Mm. <laughs> So I'll speak a little bit to that because we have not uh, gone specifically after the motivations of the participants for the workshop. We do have the surface level, what are you interested in getting? So we have that type of information. Uh, so, I, so I actually shouldn't say no, we don't have it. We just have not done a deep dive in there. I think there are other questions we could ask. But there is a, there's a general question about uh, what is bringing you to the workshop. Um, and so uh, Rick and some other colleagues, uh, Sandra, uh, Krauss Quinn at Maryland and Amanda Butts here at UW Madison, also, also members of the team, have been deep diving into that qualitative data. What's also been interesting is that we have a little bit further along uh, data in terms of qualitative interviews that have been analyzed and actually being presented tomorrow at the American Educational Research Association annual meeting down in San Antonio. Again, Dr. Amanda Butts is presenting that. Um, from another population of research mentors, so not ones that came to our training, uh, but have also been involved in working with undergraduates and graduate students as mentors. And we actually asked them about why are they motivated more or less to be culturally aware in their mentoring relationships and crosswalked that on the self-determination theory and found some very interesting trends. And if you're interested in that result, we actually have the paper that will be submitted for publication very soon, but the full conference paper is written if you're interested. And the hard part is that what we found, the self-determination theory has a, a continuum of internal motivation. I do this because it's uh, right for me. I want to be more effective for my students, uh, ranging all the way to external motivation. I do it because I don't want to be seen as a jerk or, you know, only because other people are making me do it or it seems like politically correct, but it's not introjected or internalized as a motivation. And what we found, is, as you might imagine, is that more of the um, mentors, in terms of their response to their motivation to be culturally aware, were more likely to be externally motivated. And those that are internally motivated, there's still some struggles around that. Like, how does this fit within my overall mission of being you know, part of the research training enterprise? And why should I care? It sounds like it's the right thing to do, but not quite sure how to do it. So we're wrestling with that from the qualitative data. And certainly would love to learn from you, Jody. I know that you've been doing this work for a long time at ACS. And I'd just add a little bit from the, you know, the boots on the ground, kind of a former lab, you know, director of my own lab, <laughs> and basic science versus now social science. I, it's, it's always been a mixture. You know, it's the same thing that, you know, people are motivated to get just basic improvements of their skills as mentoring. So this is kind of the, on top of basic skills of mentoring. This is kind of like mentoring 201 as opposed to 101. And it, it's all the, it's all the ranges you might guess. You've got, you know, the skeptics, you've got the people who are really curious, the people who are just fundamentally want it and enjoy it. And then you've got the people who wouldn't come near it. You know, and so, and that it's the full range. But I think partially it's, it's novel enough, which is one of the reasons that we wanted to kind of get it out there so people can be in talking about it. It's not something you've ever actually been able to talk about because there's nothing to be able to do about it. So that's why we're hoping we can begin the, the discussion about, yeah, it's something you actually can. It's, it's again moving into being an effective mentoring and effective mentoring relationships is a learnable skill. It's not something you're either born with or not, or somehow you know you stumble into it. No, these are really very, very learnable things that that we can help people learn. And I just want to add to that, Rick, as a Brown. One of the core assumptions we had that you described, which is around these are coachable, acquirable skills that must be deliberately and intentionally levied. They have to be enacted with purpose, right. with a vision, clarity. Right. 
on a regular basis, the same way we learn how to walk or talk. You know, the first time, think back to little people that you have in your life or those who have been parents, the first time a person, you know, a little person takes a step is usually not that successful. They're, they pancake, they fall on their face. You've got to keep trying. But what we're finding is really critical, and this is from all of those theories of behavior change that Rick talked about that really undergirded our assumptions, is deliberate, intentional work at these effort, at these uh, qualities are absolutely critical. It's not good enough to be to have good intentions. You must be well intended and intentional. Great. Um, I have time for a couple more questions, then I would like to highlight some of the discussion happening on Twitter from our hashtag woke mentory. <laughs> so uh, Yes, very exciting. So, Kiernan Gonzalez, is there anything that we can do to work towards CAM if we don't have access to one of the seven-hour workshops? <laughs> and I noticed there are a couple of other questions that are coming up on the on the feed of our, you know, do we have downloadable resources and things like that? Um, you know, we're just getting there. We're just getting started. <laughs> yeah. Angela, you want to pop into that one? So the answer is yes, and as you saw, one of our slides was the looking forward in 2017, and certainly all of these goals we have, not only additional trainings, but also new materials, new curricula. Um, it was, oh, I think someone might need to mute the mic, but um, it's all, it's, uh, we're really excited about the opportunities to um, move into those spaces, so very much like the entering research and entering mentoring curricula, which you've, you've seen. Uh, through SIMR website um, or through the National Research Mentoring Network. There are curricula, curricula excuse me, that are downloadable, that are easily accessible, and we're excited to eventually get there. I think what we're um, working on, it, as Rick said, is not moving too fast so that we don't have the evidence base. You know, many of our colleagues like Christine Fun and Janet Branch, who have been leading some of those curricular efforts, have about a 10-year head start on us, and so they've been able to collect the data, they have the metrics validated, and so they're really able to roll out a whole package. And we're, we're getting there, and so we're looking forward to making that publicly available in the very near future. I understand, as, as you might expect, that you know, you're know you opening up conversations that haven't happened before. You're opening spaces where people talk about things that haven't been. So it, things happen. You know, in terms of topics come up and you get into some kind of complicated discussions and things. So it takes facilitators that are pretty comfortable. That's one thing that we've really, you know, you have to be comfortable with, uh, with dealing with, uh, you know, the, the backlog of, of emotions and feelings and realities of, uh, of, of these kinds of topics and people who feel like they have been excluded and legitimately have been excluded for ways and haven't been given the same opportunity. So you have to be kind of prepared to really work with those and, and really work with them, not just, okay, yeah, now let's move on. It, it's a very different kind of a space in which this is happening. Right. And I'll just add to that and then we'll stop talking. I know there are a few more comments is that, you know, in this intervention and in this training, we're very deliberate about the demographic complementariness of the, the co-facilitators because there's a lot of modeling that happens. Um, as Rick and I, as I've mentioned that Rick and I co-facilitated co a couple of these uh, trainings together, and we've had to literally kind of be the, the projection screen, if you will, on race and gender issues in particular, even generational issues, all kinds of factors that we have to do our work ahead of time and, and be very comfortable about the transparency of our own experiences, our lived experiences, and then using that in the facilitated space. So it's pretty intensive. It's not um, something, as, as you mentioned, Rick, that's, uh, that it really is important to have a series of competencies, I think, around basic group facilitation, understanding the entering mentoring entering research curricula that are available and the principles of, of uh, competent research mentoring that we've, that we've begun to collate through a lot of colleagues uh, work around the country um, and then leveling that or, or delivering that within a culturally aware lens. It's pretty intensive. <laughs> Are there other comments, Damaris or Alexis? So absolutely. So thank you very much for providing that feedback. Um, we'd like to shift gears a little bit and uh, highlight some of the conversations happening on Twitter with hashtag woke mentoring. So um, Dr. Jonah Fierson says, Ann Byerwin's explaining this to an audience of scientists that quote unquote woke means what, what, what woke means is giving me life. Yes. Hashtag NRMN woke mentoring. 
uh, another comment from at Ashala F. We all have culture, and we contribute to the culture of our own society and environment. Know this and embrace this. Hashtag woke mentoring. Mm -hmm. And last one um, from Lil Cheyenne at Lil Cheyenne. Dr. Andrew Levires Winston gave me life today when she broke down the me meaning in staying woke. Hashtag woke mentoring. So cool. um, really great conversations. Great webinar. We need this conversation in all organizations. Hashtag woke mentoring from Olivia Ophiolo. And um, thank you very much. Uh, we're running sure. out of time here, but Dr. Rick McGee and Dr. Angela Byers Winston um, cannot appreciate you enough for presenting this valuable material. And um, all of this information, this recorded webinar, will be placed on our YouTube channel. So be sure to uh, check the, out our social media for um, all of this upcoming information and subscribe to the newsletter for upcoming webinars. Uh, such as this one. So thank you again, Dr. Angela Byers Winston and Dr. Rick McGee. Wonderful. And maybe I can uh, take this slide, and then Rick, if you want to take the last slide or reverse, just so uh, we can thank our <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> I'll just wrap us up. Um, I, again, we want to thank the National Research Mentoring Network, uh, supported by NIH, and our, as I said, fearless leader, Christine Sun, for the support and advocacy for us to kind of venture out into new spaces and expand the circle of our conversations and potentially our impact, and as mentioned on the questions and chat, ideally collaborations as well. So we're looking forward to more contributions to the hashtag Woke Mentoring Twitter feed. Um, please, as we said, as um, Alexis mentioned, to please uh, check out the NRMN Net portal. We thank you. I will end with keep calm and be culturally aware, and um, as you look to continue the conversation, here are some wonderful ways to stay in touch with the National Research Mentoring Network. So thank you. And for those who are not totally into all of the, the tweeting and chatting and these kind of things, uh, <laughs> conversation still really carries the day. And that's, again, coming back to that's what we're really hoping is to really engage these conversations any, any place we can. You could probably guess Angela and I could talk about this for forever. So, you know, but they put boundaries on us. You know, an hour is not very long, but that's okay. Thank you. Thanks, so everybody. Much. Great. Never long enough, but thanks again. Take so. care, everyone. Thanks. Thanks very much. See ya.